shouts to Stephen Morocco over at MMA Fighting, working on this piece for years. Finally, it was the right time, and he had to go through a couple of different employers. And uh, Spencer Fisher wasn't really ready to tell the story until now, but he did a huge profile on Spencer the King Fisher, who for a time in the UFC had one of the great trilogies with Sam Stout, was just a dynamite striker, heavy-handed guy who was part of that the rise, and I guess to an extent, I suppose, the fall anyway, of the Militich fighting systems. But when Militich was hot, he was one of the guys, and you can see the article there on the screen, The Cost of Being the King. The article deals with a number of topics, but basically the gist is this. At age 40-something now, a little bit older than me. 44, Luke. 44. He is uh, financially barely hanging on from a healthcare standpoint. He's on a ton of meds, uh, but really is getting totally improper care. He has uh, pretty significant brain damage. He can still function, but he can't hold a job. And things are only about to get worse. What was your takeaway from this article, BC? First of all, it was excellent work from from Morocco, as you mentioned. Um, it was a compelling, long, uh, in-depth read. So I really encourage anyone, whether you remember that name, and you should remember Spencer Fisher's name or not, uh, this is just a, a an insight into sort of what happens from the early days of we just want to get this sport noticed. And he was one of those guys who brought a lot of notice with his action fights to this is the first time in this very young sport, Luke, uh, outside of those original pioneers, and a lot of them had really bad endings as well but didn't get publicized enough, that we're getting an inside look at what the bad ending can look like if you leave everything you have in that cage. And that's something that Spencer Fisher did. It became his calling card. It was the reason he was able to, you know, max himself out and have a really nice career. Uh, my first response is this was a very sad read. I mean, it's, it's, it's almost meant to be in a way, but it really wakes you up, Luke, not just in the, brut- you know, the, the, the brutal nature of what combat sports is and how unforgiving and how even at the freaking highest level, like, you know, 1%, it seems like, uh, come out of there better off than they were beforehand. You know, aside from the, the fame and the short bursts of money, and some guys are obviously able to, to set themselves up for the, for the afterlife, but just how it takes so much from you and you have to put so much of yourself into it to be that good that this was a wake-up call at how young this sport still is. And what I mean by that, Luke, is, you know, we're what, like, you know, 26, 27 years into the actual UFC, you know, not even three decades into ultimate fighting, mixed martial arts being an actual sport. There are not even close, you know, we talk about a union, there aren't even close to the proper foundational things set up to take care of these guys who entertain us, who provide us with a platform to have these jobs, who fuel the damn UFC and allow them to become a billion dollar organization and have that huge sale. There's no, you know, pension fund afterlife, uh, anything. This guy just needs his, uh, you know, his medical bills paid for and needs, it needs, uh, it, it, you know, forget the income. I mean, this is just a sad situation. A guy who can barely work and probably won't be able to much longer was deemed that he can't work in a regular job. And, uh, you know, you find out that he was one of those recipients of the sort of Dana White, Matt Hughes, you know, Forrest Griffin, Stephen Bonner type of handshake. Matt, thank you so much for your service. Here's 5000 a month, uh, you know, for the next you know, not the rest of your life until it ran out after the sale. But the sad part about that, Luke, is, you know, Morocco kind of puts in there that maybe that was hush money. Maybe that was we know you can't fight anymore and you're going to be pretty much bad off. So here's some money to uh, to just try to get by. And then eventually that money was gone. It's a wake up call, Luke, that um, let me say it like this. Sometimes in boxing in particular, we watch these big pay-per-view fights and they're not wars, right? Sometimes they're not even competitive. Sometimes you figure out early who's the better guy and the fight just kind of plays out like that. And we're like, man, why aren't these guys doing what the guys did in the freaking 70s and the 80s and the early 90s when I love this sport? Um, you ever see Riddick Bowe lately? That's why oh, they don't do I, it. I saw him, dude. I saw him. I saw him. I told you this. I saw him almost, I got 10 years ago now almost at the uh, Con yeah. Peterson weigh-ins. He looked bad, dude. I mean, and, and, there, and it's not just him. It's a lot of those guys, right? And it's like... You know, not everybody ends up with the money of a Sugar Ray Leonard or, or a Muhammad Ali or whatever, but even Ali obviously physically was was, was in a, a bad state really soon after the career ended. The reason why, Luke, you don't see as many people as you want in theory to just leave it all in the damn fighting arena is because what do you get from that? This was a wake-up call to that. This is a great sport, 
And part of, again, the entertainment level and the, and the reason why this brand of the UFC has gotten to this point was because of people like Spencer Fisher who would go out there on undercards or whatever and just bleed, baby, and just leave it all out there. Um, there, there doesn't, there doesn't seem to be any setup in boxing either, you know, for, for, for a, for a happy ending afterwards. And it's not just financially; it's having the means to, to have the care you need and the medicine and all that. Um, this was a huge wake up call that I think everybody should read, and the reason why fighters need to band together. And this isn't meant as a rant against the UFC, although you can certainly read through the lines on this story, as I mentioned, whether it was the stuff about the UFC's doctor or whatever, and, and get the, the message that you're supposed to get from reading that story. But it's a wake-up call to the fighters more than anything, Luke. I wish every UFC fighter today would read this story, and hopefully they are. And and I love that it inspired uh, Gray Maynard to go on the campaign he's done over Twitter in the last year to kind of put the pay disparity out there. Um, the bad news, Luke, and we, we tease this sometimes, to get the proper care for fighters financially and more than that, that, that they deserve, it might end up sacrificing some of the entertainment that we all love. But they freaking deserve it. This guy's 44, and he... And he can't function, and it's and it's CTE, and it's and it's a shame. And you know, this is a guy who, I mean, yeah, he he had a blip on the radar where he was looking to be in title contention, but we're not even talking about a you know former champion or someone that that is just at the front of your mind. In a lot of ways, it was it was a journeyman, lovable guy who put on really great fights and had a season where he was a legitimate contender. But it's like they're just forgotten once they're gone, and. Um, you know, it, as a media member, it can it can do the same thing that it does to you when you see a death in the ring or a horrible injury in boxing, and you're like, you know, recalibrates. What what am I really doing here? What am I really covering? I'm not saying that because you know I, I want to take some hard moral stance and look for a way out. I just think there are more things that we can do, or, or that the promoters can do, or that anyone can do to kind of create the right structures, foundational things that the fighters need. Whether that's a union, I don't know, but you see it with the NFL guys banding together in the lawsuits and trying to get. You know, just their health care taken care of for the for the second half of their life. Um, I want to see that same for the UFC fighters. This is very sobering. Look, very. Yeah, you I, know, not I, to, go ahead. No, I just uh, not to be all Debbie Downer here, but this was this was rightfully sobering. That's what you should have took from reading this. Yeah, I mean, everything can't just be happy all the time. Every story can't just be what a great success UFC had in 2020, or you know, the next show is going to be on ABC, or you know, we'll see what Bellator has cooked up. In 2021, that is also part of the story. Those are things you also should not ignore. Everything plays a role here, and every part of it deserves to be acknowledged, um, especially the good, but also parts of the bad. And the bad tends to reveal itself uh, more often than not in this game because the safety protocols certainly have gotten better. It takes some time to, to reveal itself. I mean, the reason why the story is so important is that it took time to tell, right? You couldn't just rush out after a fight, stick a microphone in his face after his last contest and get these kinds of answers. Things had to mature over time, and it's that longitudinal perspective where you really begin to get a clear picture of the truth, right? The short-term truth, and even the long-term truth, are, are certainly a province of the UFC, but the long-term realities for fighters, those stories are not easy to tell, but when they are told, they are in critically, critically important. I have a few reactions to this. The first thing I would say is, um, and I was texting, texting this to some people yesterday. There are not many things in this fight game where I feel like I have a moral imperative to cover. So, for example, um, I'm going to cover the UFC's event this, this Saturday, but do I feel like I have a moral imperative to be there Saturday to you know cover the results and do a post-fight whatever? No, not necessarily. I don't feel like that's a moral obligation. It might be a professional obligation, but not a moral one. But when it comes to fighter pay... And when it comes to making sure that they have the appropriate amount of leverage, whatever that may end up being through Ali Act or various lawsuits or a union, I do feel like I have a moral imperative. A lot of people ask me, how can you cover a sport where it breaks people this way? And the answer is, I feel like it's my duty to help break them less. Um, because you can't really talk them out of it. There are people who come out the other side just fine. That part needs to be acknowledged as well. But for the people who are getting broken by it unless someone does something about it. And in the case of media, all you can really do is raise visibility for it. Um, uh, it's going to continue to happen. It's going to continue to happen. I feel like if you are a media member and you are not shining a light as, as, as much as reasonably possible on the reality of fighter pay and the reality of fighter leverage, you're a coward. You're just a coward, and it deserves to be acknowledged as much. The second thing I would say is 
there's a lot of arguments that go into about who does more to make MMA work. Is it the promoter who puts up all of their money and makes uh, you know the arena happen and puts up all the lights and blah, blah, blah? Or is it the fighters who go in there and fight? And the answer is, of course, it's a shared responsibility. But a lot of times you'll see people defend it and say, well, the promoters are the only ones risking anything. Wow, bullshit. What a ridiculous comment that is. I mean, you just go and look at what Spencer Fisher, and by the way, he is hardly alone. There's going to be many more of him coming, folks. Trust me. The idea that only the promoter is putting up something, I'm not here to diminish that they are. Of course they are. And so many have lost a ton of money and gone bankrupt in the process. That's a real story, too. But this is a real story, and this is an ongoing story, and it's not an isolated one. Don't ever forget the cost that these people have to pay to put themselves in this position. And I think the last thing, BC, just sort of worth focusing on here is it is true that these fighters also bear some responsibility for their own plight. I think that part is true, right? Well, look, they know what they're getting into, right? Like, we're not going to be... You and I are not naive right now. This is freaking punching people in the head. You do know what you're getting into, so that's... Yeah, yeah. and on top of that, I mean, you know, listen... um, well, even that's, well, that's a slippery slope too a little bit, BC. I mean, yes, there's no denying that punching in the head is bad for you. Okay, but like, what does that mean when the rubber meets the road? Here's my point. Did they know at the time of Miltich fighting systems that the kind of hazing they were doing as training would result in lives like they have today? Probably not. They probably did not think it would, would, would result in where they are today, where Tim uh, Sylvia is on, you know, go fund me to pay for surgery. Obviously, Matt Hughes' situation is a little bit different because he had a traumatic uh, accident with a train. Um, but, you know, a lot of these guys are ending up just by hook or by crook in these really bad, awful positions. So best practices are getting better. And to that extent, fighters have a responsibility to investigate them. But I, I just feel like as much as the blame should be put on them for, you know, understanding what they're getting into, these are people, B.C., who think that every day when they wake up, they're the best candidate to win the lottery. That's the kind of mentality you have to have if you want to be a prize fighter. Any shred of doubt, anything to derail you from from getting through that workout, that sparring session, and ultimately that fight is going to do exactly that. So they shut it all out as a means of success. All I'm pointing out is it's going to be very hard to get these guys to accept risk when they're 25 years old, especially if they're doing well. All the more reason to have something after they're done to take care of the ones who desperately need it, whether right. it's healthcare and or it's, financial resources or some combination. The reason why I think the, the Spencer Fisher story, this specific to- story being told the way it was is important, Luke, because look, like not every fighter that's ever stepped foot in the octagon is going to deserve this type of treatment. But Fisher's a guy who, you know, like came, came as close as you can come to being a legitimate title contender and, and being an action guy and a fun guy, but then sort of just disappeared when his career was over. And you don't hear him talk about a lot. But that guy was one of the key cogs who bled to to get to keep the UFC going during an important time. So there probably should be some kind of tier system, Luke. You know, some type of merit that has to be reached, whether amount of fights or wins or something that allows you to say to yourself, I know the risks. This is not safe. This is not a safe sport. And if I fight the way I love fighting, that fans love, that the promoter loves, uh, it's going to be double as risky. But I will take that chance because that's the way I'm wired. I'm opportunistic. I love to fight, blah, blah, blah. Because I know that there is at least something at the end of the road that will take care of my family and I, right? And by the way, this is not some chump. He had wins. I mean, if you're new to MMA, this won't mean anything to you. But if you know anything about it, it should. He had wins over Josh Neer, Tiago Alves, Aaron Riley. Uh, Matt Wyman, Dan Lazan, Sam Stout, Cal Uno, Jeremy Stevens. I mean, and a fight he wasn't... of the night guy, like a fight of the night guy waiting to happen, right? Like <laughs> right. just a dude. He's a, he was a very good fighter. Now, in the end, it petered out. He lost one, two, three, four, five, five of his last six, and most of those, by, uh, no, those were mostly by decision. But still, you know, yes, he at the end he faded quite badly. But he was a. I mean, he couldn't beat the very best BC, but he beat the rest. But here's the deal, like. We talk about this a lot. The culture Dana White creates. Look at the Dana White Contender Series. The culture is about, we're going to put four or five fights out there on this broadcast. 
And if you win, it doesn't mean you're part of our organization. It's whoever impresses us the most with your savagery. It's a, it's a setup with the bonus system that is set up to try to create Gotti Ward every fight, every night. How many times do we see Dana upset at people, Yoel Romero, after the Adesanya fight, you know, uh, for not going after it? Well, look, there's got to be something for them, Luke. And I'm not in a in a fantasy world that everybody's going to be covered with a huge pension for life. But look, the same reason why there's this giant lawsuit right now against the UFC that was probably modeled after the giant lawsuit against the NFL. Because if you're going to to be the soldiers in this war to help the to help the boss, you know, win and keep business going, and you're watching this company get sold for billions, and all these great things are happening. And you got nothing to show for it. The only way we're really going to make a change, Luke, is if the fighters band together and create whatever non bjorn Rebney run foundational, almost union-like thing they can do to start hearing their voice heard. Because if they don't, then yes, they are repra- replaceable cogs in this engine. And we all tune in hoping they will give away the rest of the good years of their life on one night in the cage for our entertainment. And uh, we've said this a few times. It's the media's responsibility in some ways to bring light to it, but it's going to be the fighters' responsibilities to band together, the ones who have leverage, the ones who are maybe are right in the middle of their prime now and can easily have the same attitude that Spencer Fisher had in his prime of thinking, oh, that won't happen to me, you know, whatever. I mean, look, in the story it showed Fisher's trying to hide you know, illnesses and things. I mean, he's just trying to get back into fights to make money. Um, We don't want to be in a system where that has to be the way, right? So hopefully stories like this will be the right wake-up call, not only to the UFC and other promoters, Bellator included, to, to, to take great care of their athletes or the best that they financially can, but really for the fighters, Luke, to build something to, to support themselves and the guys that are going to come after them. And that's why unions happen, Luke, right? I mean, that's, you know, that's... This is just the stakes are a lot higher. This isn't working down at the factory, right? This is this is uh, this is pretty bad. Uh, what are your thoughts on probably the juiciest part of the story? The comments about the UFC doctor who, uh, in the end, reached back out to the Fisher family and basically surmised after talking to them that maybe Spencer Fisher was exaggerating his symptoms and that that the CTE isn't really CTE and it might not have been caused by fighting. And oh, yeah. by the way, blah blah blah. Yeah. And you saw the comments from that same doctor in another podcast who basically said the people that are fighters, they would probably be in crime if they didn't pick fighting. So all this damage, they, they happen, they, this saved them. I mean, this is the biggest, like, like, uh, uh, remember that movie sleepers? Do you remember when, uh, Kevin Bacon at the end, after explaining his rapes of young children was like, I made you tough, right? I, I made um, you tough. You know? I, I learned, I learned this lesson really vividly. In 2000, was it 2012? I can't remember when it was. It was when RG3 had the game, uh, the quarterback then for the Redskins, um, now the Washington football team, when he was already had a banged up knee and then Mike Shanahan sent him back out there and his knee just got torn to absolute pieces. He tore his PCL, his MCL, his ACL, everything else. And you'll recall that the team doctors were interviewed about it and they were like, you know, we felt like with a couple of shots of cortisone, we could just send him back out there, no problem. And it was, and then you had the, that huge investigation the Washington Post did, where team doctors were just forcing, you know, prescription narcotics on their players over and over again, creating all kinds of chemical dependencies. I've long learned that I don't give a damn if a doctor takes the Hippocratic oath. If any doctor out there, not any, but in many cases, I should say, in many cases, what I have found is if you see like team doctor for various NFL or sports team or you know, doctor in-house for this promotion or that promotion. They may very well do a good job, but you should at least take a second look because what often ends up happening is they do their job for healthcare in the service of the people paying them for it. Well, in this case, the fighters aren't per se paying them or RG3 wasn't paying uh, the that particular doctor for their healthcare. It was the team. Uh, that was who was really signing the checks. So whoever is signing the checks is going to get health care in accordance with those needs sometimes. Now, again, I'm sure that there are many scrupulous doctors who do get checks from teams or other sports organizations, and that's not the deal. But I have become extremely skeptical about any doctor who fulfills that kind of role. And if you watch enough sports, you'll see this thing over and over and over again. By the way, BC, especially at the collegiate level. Oh, it's so bad over there. 
Yeah, this is bad. And 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 I'm also not naive to something I teased earlier that we've talked about, Luke. That the safer we try to make this sport, and again, you know, we're just over 25 years into it. These are the prehistoric days, Luke. We look at UFC like one through ten as the prehistoric days when guys with one glove fought, you know, guys in a gi. No, this is still the prehistoric days in terms of how fighters are cared for. But to clean it up, Luke, and to help the fighters, you'll probably see less of the Guida versus Diego Sanchez types fights, you know, on a whole. Um, there's going to come a point, Luke, where you're going to look at it and go, is it worth it, right? Certainly will. When the camera's rolling, I like the danger in it. The heart pounds. It defies logic. Thrilling to me.